All right, okay. So uh, this is a session which is a journey I've had to go through. Um, I started out um, just hacking away at PowerShell and ended up with a collection of scripts. And I've kind of over the past five years, maybe, I've kind of moved on from that. So it's kind of my journey from starting to hack scripts together to how I now develop scripts. So um, it's going to take you through the life cycle of turning those scripts from probably just stashed away on your laptop in a temp folder or wherever you keep them, uh, into turning those into some, some functions and some modules, and then how you can sh go about sharing those with your colleagues, or even um, we should, I think we should have time, but even how you would publish that to the PowerShell gallery. Um, so uh, I'm a live services specialist at Sage Software. Um, we're, I get, always get wrong to say we're an accountancy firm because we're not an accountancy firm. We do a lot more than that, but um, we have offices all around the world. We've got uh, offices in Atlanta, Singapore, Australia. South Africa, the UK, you name it, it's it's massive, we're a massive acquisition firm, so there's a good chance there's a there's a sage office somewhere close by. Um I've uh, been doing PowerShell for four, five ish years, I'm not counting. I just update that slide with it an extra number and leave the ish on the end when I think it's incremented. Um and that's my contact details, Twitter, get to my blog. Um so yeah, like I said, I've got an, I've got an office background. Uh, but I'm now in a more DevOps focused role and classes as a live services specialist because we don't like the term DevOps engineer. Um, but it's effectively I'm responsible for all of our um, uh, software as a service hosted in Azure and AWS. Uh, we've currently got around 12,500 databases, about 700 IaaS VMs, and a good mixture of PaaS and IaaS. Um, we have uh, about 400 products in total across the entire company. We're not responsible for all 400, thankfully, but it's it's a big portfolio. Um, I can also, I think I thought I updated that slide. You can, um, Are we meeting? Oh, no. no. uh, you can often find me, or sometimes find me, streaming some Microsoft PowerShell stuff on Twitch. Uh, it seems to be a bit of a new thing. And um, there's a few people doing PowerShell development on there, so um, I, I plan on getting back into a decent schedule with that. Um, so all the stuff you're going to see is actual screenshots or actual scripts from a, a memory stick. I've got stash, stash that when I back my laptops up when I leave work that isn't intellectual property, I, I kind of keep them as a, um, I wouldn't say a keepsake because they're hor horrible to look at. But um, this probably looks familiar to uh, to some people. Um, I wasn't used to writing scripts, and um, so my approach to it was haphazard. Um, I was doing a lot of copying and pasting from Stack Overflow. I still do. Uh, I didn't really understand what the scripts were doing, and most of the time, because I didn't know any better, I was running those scripts in production. Uh, and because of all of those things. Um, I um, keyboard not connected properly. Um, um, yeah, I had mixed results. So it's obviously all, my, all the scripts were stored locally. I was under the impression that I was going to be the only one using them, so I didn't have any error handling. Um, I had hard coded variables or file paths or Active Directory all use in my scripts because I didn't really know how to deal with making them reusable as yet. Um, I didn't have any backups of the scripts that I was running because they were on my laptop. Uh, generally, just dumped around on the C drive somewhere. Um, can I turn my volume up? Volume any better? Cool. Yeah, so I basically did everything that you shouldn't do when writing scripts, but 
because I don't have a CS degree, I don't have a script in the background, and I've actually got more qualifications in uh, as a joiner than I have in IT. Um, so when I left school, I, I went into the building trade and I was at the joinery, fitting kitchens, bathrooms, the lot, and then moved into IT in about 2007. Started on the service desk and worked my way up to the point where I was I was on the third line and everything was so such a large scale that you had to start learning how to script. So um, I had no access. There was no access control. So anything that I did share, most of you have probably been through a scenario where you set up a, a jump box and all of your scripts are stored on the jump box and everything's locked down or not with NTFS permissions. Um, and I've worked places where they're, they're wide open. So there's there's none of that going on. And you, you have no way of sharing scripts other than giving somebody the, the actual script of copying it, but then you lose control over where it's being run and how it's being run and are they modifying it. And you'll generally have to support it until you die if you do that. Um, the other thing which I was renowned for was using version control, but in a folder, so and appending the version at the end of the script. Um, I think the key thing throughout all of those iterations of the versions is that we never corrected the spelling of finance, which I think is pretty fundamental. <laughs> I, mean, I probably wouldn't change it now. Just it's 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 in there. <laughs> um, yeah. about, what about uh, using control inside the script? Have we all done this. Yeah. Um, this this is from the same script. This is from the finance 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 script. Um, yeah, and it's this is terrible in terms of. People can go and modify the script and not update your change log, so you have no idea what's changed, and then you end up having to diff the files by opening both of them. And it's awful to keep track of, and people are terrible at remembering. So, um, it's it's terrible. Source source control and version control are the two things that learning something like Git helps with drastically because it takes all of those pain points away and the access control to an extent. Um, so the next thing to think about is you'll generally write a script. You'll be really pleased with it because you, uh, you've you written something that works or if it errors, you know how to fix it. And it's generally not a pretty way But sharing your code. When you get to that point, you've written a script or a module for the first time and somebody asks for it because it's going to save them some time. And it makes you think, about all of the other things that you should really be thinking about from the start. So error handling. Um, obviously, when if, when you're running your own scripts, if something breaks and you go, it's fine, I can read back up the, the, the screen and see what broke and then go and fix it manually. Um, when you share your code, you've got to think about consistency. So when if it runs once and runs fine, that's great, but if it runs a second time and it doesn't work because you don't have that error handle in there or some other unknown variable that you haven't taken taken into account, your colleague is going to come running back and say, um, "This didn't work. Can you can you fix it?" Or they'll just resolve back to doing something manually. Um, visibility, visibility. So when you're sharing your code, a lot of, a lot of people are, are are daunted by the fact that other people are going to be able to see the code, and they see it as a bad thing, whereas I think the, the attitude to have towards that or to try and get it is that it's a good thing because you'll get feedback about your code, about how you're writing it and whether or not it works. So um, making your code visible is one of the things we try and do with all of the internal teams. Everything goes into Git, everything is visible to the dev team, to us, and it also means that other people can contribute to it as well. Uh, performance. Um, I'll not touch on that too much, but uh, I think Chris Gardner did a session at Summit, which was, don't do that, do this, that might be the other one. But yeah, he did one anyway, and it, I think the, the key thing he, he touched on was performant enough. If you have a script which runs overnight, collecting some information from Active Directory, exchanging some HR systems, and it takes three hours to run, do you really need to shave 10 minutes off that? 
if it runs overnight and you just use the data the next day, probably not. But if you've got something that runs for 10 minutes, but you have another task that runs after that, you may need to start looking at the performance and, uh, and how you work with, uh, how, how you improve on those scripts. So things like arrays, looping arrays, using the old method rather than using array lists or generic lists. Um, compatibility is another one you've got to think of. Um, PowerShell 7 Preview 2 dropped today. I don't know how many of you are using PowerShell Core or PowerShell 7. Um, one, there's a lot of uh, complacency within the community, I think, around uh, compatibility with old scripts. And it's, I think it's one thing that the PowerShell team are trying to work on, but you've got to think about that as well. Is are your scripts can't going to be compatible with your current machines? The other thing that has just been talked about today actually is um, Windows 7 and PowerShell Get, and the modules have a version folder inside which doesn't work with all the versions. So you, it's, it's one of the things you've got to take into account uh, when you're writing scripts to share. Uh, usability, you know how it works because you wrote it. Is giving your code to someone else, is it going to be immediately evident? To them, how they need to, how do they need to work with it? And security is another one. We've all heard the horror stories of npm packages being revoked or dependencies upon dependencies upon dependencies having vulnerabilities and things like that. So, and also the obviously the hard coded variables and, uh, and secrets within scripts. And secret management is a topic in itself. So, it, it is tough to do, especially when you first get started. It's a case of like, yeah, I'll just put this in here, nobody will see it, it's fine. And then before you know it, it's in Git. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a tough one to get to get your head around at first. Next, isn't it? Um, so PowerShell scripts from me. Um, they should be in source control. Whenever I start a PowerShell script or a PowerShell module or any kind of script, the first thing I do is either create a folder locally and then run git in it, which creates a local PowerShell, a local git repository, um, or I'll create a repo in GitHub or Azure DevOps, uh, Azure repos, and then pull that down and work on it from there. And then if your laptop dies, you've got your code backed up as long as you remember to push. And it also means that from the off, you're thinking about those sharing sharing your code so the context and the way that you write your code is totally different to how you would use hack something together. Um, it should have unit tests. Uh, this is another one for me which was a, a massive head paradigm shift and still now I, I contemplate what am I writing, why am I writing it, is this right, am I writing unit tests or integration tests, do I know what, what I'm even writing. It's, it's one of those things that it, takes, it took me months, literally months to get my head around. But once I start writing unit tests, my code that I wrote was better because of it. Because it was basically you were being analytical of your own code before anyone else seen it. Um, consistency uh, is key in terms of picking a style. I mean, I could throw the different brace styles around the room and you would probably all start fighting until the end of the meeting. Um, but just pick a, pick a style that you like, pick a style that works for everyone on the team and stick to it. And then it's much easier for people to share code. It's much easier for people to adopt your code and contribute to it rather, rather than having, I think, uh, some of the scripts I've got, which I'll show you, have got three different gray styles in one script because that's what Stack Robot all said. Um, but likewise, if you contribute to somebody else's code, don't think, their, their brackets are in the wrong place and go and modify all of their code just if you can adapt to how they write their scripts. Uh, so yeah, pick a style, stick to it, and uh, it'll, you'll be better off because of that because you'll learn to read the code and you'll be able to pick it up a lot quicker. Um, and think about are you delivering value? Um, we frequently get questions in the, uh, the PowerShell Slack Discord channels where people come and go, I'm going to write this amazing thing and it's and basically somebody redesigning the wheel. I think the one I, I mentioned the other week was somebody came in and said, should they write a ticketing system in PowerShell? And everyone went, no, no, you should not write a ticketing system in PowerShell because there's thousands of them. Write something else. So whilst it would probably be fun to do, um, the first thing you'd have to think about is databases, which immediately makes PowerShell a lot more difficult. 
but think about are you delivering value to in, in the time that you're going to spend writing that code because if you spend two months writing something that doesn't get used, it's a waste of your time and your employer's time. Um, and this was one quote which was by Nicole Forsberg, I think it was on Scott Hanselman's podcast, uh, based around the unit tests, which which totally stuck with me. Um, the developers who write unit tests write more testable code, and that is proven based on the unit tests that I've written. Writing unit tests made me see where I had duplication in my code because I was trying to test it. I was like, why am I writing the same test three times? Oh, all I have to do is move this outside the if block, and now I've got one test for the entire thing. So it, it makes you think about the context of the script and how you're, how you're going to use it, uh, how you're going to write it, but also if you're testing it, it obviously means that you can catch any errors early on as well. Um, your first module, well, if you were like me, it was probably copied from a blog post. Um, I remember being in the UK version of the PowerShell Slack, and I was asking questions, and they were like, you should write a function, you should write a module, and I was like, right, okay, I'm going to go in, Google those terms, and then see what happens. And then not a lot happened, but I, I found a blog post, uh, and it was probably Warren Frame's blog post, the S Cookie Monster, Ramblin' Cookie Monster that you came across first. Was the first one I came across, uh, and that was quite a while ago, and it was it, it was great. Um, I had no idea what it was doing or why, but following the steps in that blog post got me a PowerShell module, and uh, obviously I, I I then got another job because of, no, I didn't really. Um, it was <laughs> it was horrendous. I had no idea what I was doing. I was blindly copying code from the internet and running it, and then things happened, and I didn't know why things were happening. I had lots of issues exporting functions correctly. Um, and because I did it so infrequently, because I wrote one PowerShell module and then moved on to clusters new and bigger things, and the next time I went back to it, I was, had to go find the same blog post and go back through it to find to remember what I did. Uh, and this is this is the, uh, the excerpt that people generally use within the PowerShell modules. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, it's quite small. Um, but this is this is actually in one of our internal modules where I work now, because somebody inside the company made a, a PowerShell module and uh, did the same thing that I did, installed Warren Frame's blog post and created the module from it. And um, this is now in a build pipeline, which it goes through Zero DevOps and is published to our internal PowerShell gallery. Not using this. Um, this works. I mean, I don't have any issues with this. This this works for you. It works. But there's there's, there's a few issues with this, which I'll, I'll go over a little later on. Um, and you might be happy to know that's all of my slides because uh, death to PowerPoint. Um, so I've got some demos. Um, which I'll jump through. Yes, go. Um, so, uh, I'm using Visual Studio Insiders. If this looks strange to anyone, uh, you've got new fancy switchy buttons. Um, I'm also using PowerShell 7 and the PowerShell preview extension because, I mean, I, I clearly like to look dangerously and spend most of my time debugging why things don't work. Um, so, to get started, I'll show you um, a couple of functions say functions, they're not functions yet, a couple of scripts which I dug out of um, my long list of terrible scripts from about 2016-17 um, and they probably look familiar. Um, is that text big enough? Do you need to get to read that? You're all on mute, somebody nod. Is that big enough? <laughs> Okay, um, so when I first started, everything was in CSV format because I did not know how to do anything else. So everything went in as a CSV and everything went out as a CSV because that's generally how you get given information and that's generally how you need to send information. Um, so CSVs were my life um, and probably a lot of other people's their ideal ways of sharing information between different systems and different people, but they're terrible for running interactively because you obviously need to provide CSV to them. And we've got the output array here, which you're probably all familiar with, which defines an empty array, and then you add 
your content to that using the op add operator further down. Um, so the first thing you'd probably do, you've probably got an admin server with uh, scheduled tasks which run all of your automation. Um, and then your first port of call will be creating a parameter block. Actually, what I did for the points. And then, if you want to provide this schedule task, you obviously need to pass it into the command line by running partial and actually pass to the file and then be able to pass the parameter into it. And then you'll probably have a file path, which means you don't need that because your CSV is not being passed in. You're going to provide it as the parameter. So you do need that, so you just don't need the path. And then define your define your array, and then for each user in that array from the CSV file, which is just a username and email address, you want to get the get a the user. So you're running this against the Active Directory. You want the email address property. You're using uh, command line addresses. So you want to be able to. You know, Object select object even. And then you've got an error action stop on the end of there so that and it's within a try block. So if that fails to find the user in the field, it'll jump into the catch block and on both instances and create a custom object. And all literally all it's doing is adding the email address and whether or not the person was found in AD as a status. Can you still see my screen? Yep. <clears throat> All right, the video has gone up on your end, so I was just making sure it wasn't my bandwidth. Oh. Dead. We're still here. That's fine. <laughs> um, so a couple of these things, this is this is generally now frowned upon using the array like this. Um, and what you would probably do is either define an array list, which now has also been deprecated by .NET. You would use a generic list. Or failing that, what I would probably do is remove the properties, remove the properties, and then remove the output, remove the output array, and then this would be the, the makings of your script. So you pass, you pass the CSV file in to the param block now, it imports it, it loops through, and then you don't need that. You literally look the person up. If the person's found, it outputs a custom object. If they're not, they output a custom object that tells you that they're not found. And that should be on that sign. That should be on that sign. So if you're a file like this, or a, a script like this, the, the, the way it turned into a function is quite simple. Right. The button's going on my keyboard. <laughs> it's just slow for some reason. Oh, no, it's going to do everything again. Right, okay. Function. Get. We may have just lost the victory. Can you hear? No, no, I'm at. Uh... I'm making sure that uh, my son isn't stealing all the bomb out my for this PlayStation. 
So I've just kicked him off. The <laughs> I've just kicked, kicked him off the roof. <laughs> so that's now what was a script you had it open to run to fill the CSV details out to a, a script file which you could run interactively uh, run via a schedule, uh, scheduled task to now a function which is something that you could run interactively um, I'm not going to run that because I don't actually have AD running um, but I've got another one that I can get to AD oh, my keyboard responded much quicker than the disconnect um, the next one I've got is similar, lots of old fashioned ways that you probably wouldn't use now. Um, I'm importing the module for Active Directory, but mm -hmm. for reason, I'm not using it. So I have no idea why that's in there. The same thing, I'm using uh, import CSV because CSVs are life. <laughs> And I'm going to clear this because naming things is hard. I don't need that. And then it basically needs a pull up again. And then you need. I would say file, but what I would probably do is the IP address and make that a string array instead, and then you get rid of the CSV altogether. And then I don't need the array. I wouldn't make this a PS custom object. I would make this an order hash table. And then for each thing, and, uh, yeah, get rid of that. If test connection required. Results on the thing. So it's going to be uh, server and status. Yeah, so it's going to be status. So add console. Oh my word. I should have left my old. I changed keyboards to my wireless keyboard before. And I should have just left the other one in because clearly I've been typing this one in a while. file altogether because I don't need that. So this is something that I should be able to run. Um get the status IP address nothing happens because I'm um, not using um, test connection thing. Nothing happens because it's going to be a You ignore this because test connection is broken in PowerShell 7 and PowerShell Core, where the quiet switch doesn't work. So if we just pretend this was in uh, 5.1, it should have it should have worked. <laughs> There's an R for that if you're going to go and comment in it and see how, how rubbish it is. Um, 
But yeah, so now rather than import CSV, you've now got to control where you can use this with your command line, you can use it in other scripts. You can still import the CSV, the topic is script, but then just call the function import CSV and then further down I'm just get ping IP address CSV. The, the, the abstract only logic away you you make this do one thing and it's much easier to write, it's much easier to read, it's much easier to reuse. You can use this across an array of, of scripts now rather than uh, rather than have it hard coded so that you have to go and update the CSV every time. Got some other stuff in here, um which is um just the other stuff I've written for some reason I've got command line pointed out on that. And I did have hard coded server names and a lot of this is really awful and sometimes I use three spaces instead of four. And so this is all old stuff that I would go back and refactor if uh if, if I didn't throw up by looking at it. But it, it, it gives you an idea so that I've see I've used bright braces on the next line there for some bizarre reason. Um, there. I wrote this myself as well, I didn't steal it on stack the blow. Uh, but yeah, it gives you an idea of how you can go back and look at those scripts that, that do, do take a bit of time to run and you're not sure that you, you, you know you've got that code somewhere and you would normally go and copy and paste it out and reuse it by turning it into functions you can reuse that anywhere and if you turn that into modules you can also share that and have it run as if you were downloading it from the PowerShell gallery it gives you greater control and once you've got unit tests in there as well you can be guaranteed that when you share your code, as long as you write your unit tests correctly, um, that it's going to behave the same for your colleagues and peers. Um, so the, going on to modules, so all a module is is a collection of functions, which you can import. That, yeah, I presume a lot of all of you have imported and mod, installed and imported the module from the PowerShell gallery. This is just you writing your own. And um, so the quickest way. To write a PowerShell module is if you don't care about all the stuff and all the other stuff that comes with writing a PowerShell module. Um, you can literally just put all of your functions in one file and rename it as a PSM1 file. And then you should be able to do import module samples. Admin scripts get command in the module admin scripts. That's a module. Have all of your functions in one file, change the name to a PSM1 file rather than a PS1 file, and you have a module. You don't get any of the extra stuff for the versions, you don't get greater control over any dependencies and things like that that you want to write. But if you just want to be able to import all of your functions, this is effectively given the same as. Doing the same as what Warren for instance is doing. I think I've got that in the action. Yeah, PSM one file. So all this, all this basically says is go through my folder, get all of my public and private functions, and then import them into my session by dot sourcing, and then export the function. We've got export the public function. So effectively, by renaming to a PSM one file, you're just bringing all of these functions in your public session. And then you can add that to your profile. You can import that when you need it, as long as it's in your PS module path. Um, but if you go into the, this length to have modules, you may as well have a look and do a module with a module manifest. And then you can start progressing and writing modules that you can share with colleagues, which are in better in better nick, yeah, in better condition, and you get the more viable and you get a bit greater control over what's in there, who can run them, what functions are being exported, any dependencies if you have a reliance on say the active directory module and things like that. Um so I've created a, a new PowerShell module function here, which literally just quickly scaffolds out a new PowerShell module. Shell module Not 
there. So that's created another folder called Toolbox. It's created a public folder with nothing in it and a private folder with nothing in it. It's created me a module manifest, which is what you will generate as when you create a module. So there's a built-in function for that. Module manifest. Maybe we'll show you what's here. But all of these things in here map to and is within your module manifest. The basic stuff you need if you look back at my function is you need a path of where you're going to put it, and it needs to have a PSD1 file type. And it needs to be named the same as your folder. It doesn't need to, but going up the best practice and saving you a lot of pain. Name the folder that you're putting everything in the name of your module. Name the PSD1 and the PSM1 the same names. So all that's doing is I'm taking a name called Toolbox. It creates a folder called Toolbox. It jumps into that folder and creates two folders called Public and Private. Uses new module manifest with Splatten, which I believe Jonathan showed you maybe last month, another one before on how to do Splatten. Um, and then it just splats the three basic things you need for a module manifest. Creates that, and then just because it's a Git folder, it's a Git library, I create a Git ignore, and then I output in the Git ignore. So when later on in my process, it ignores the output folder that's in there. So looking into that, what you can then do is you can take all of the descriptions you've just done. Get things You can take all of the all of the functions that you've got, you can move them into your public folder. So then you've now got two boxes left. All of these are going to be public because you want to use them. Anything that in, goes in private is sort of internal logic. So if you've got a really complex script or you want you have a function that is used within one of your other functions. You don't want the users to use it, you put it in private and then don't export. <coughs> so all the public functions are for public consumption. All the private functions are so you can control your internal logic, but the users don't see that when they use your module. Um, and then what I would normally do from there is um, you can update your PSD1 file. Um, and what you would normally do is um, do not use wildcards. In here it tells you this is what, how you export your functions. So when the module is imported, these are the functions that the user gets to see. So the functions to export in this module, do not use wildcards. Use an empty array if there are no, no, nothing to export. I don't understand why it then uses a wildcard to do that for you. When it tells you not to do that. But what I would generally do is just resort to using build scripts and CD PS. So rather than do more of this manually, we tap the level of toolbox, create a new file called build.ps1. And then another script which you can run. Um, you've probably heard of it Pisake, Pisake. I'm not sure how um, 
I hope you pronounce that. I think a letter one pronounces it exactly. I'm not sure what Japanese rice wine has to do with builds, building partial modules, but um, this is a quick build script that I've written, which is exactly the same, or it's not exactly the same because it's not as concise, but similar, where it builds, takes all of the PSM, PS1 files. Gets all of the content of each file, and it compiles them all into a single PSM1 file. So what I showed you earlier with this, this PSM1 file, the build process of our module is going to end up like this, and then that's what you distribute. There's various reasons for that. So if um, security, one of them. So if you're blindly importing everything that's in the public folder. Somebody could maliciously drop something in there, and your build script just goes. Uh, your module goes. Okay, import everything that's in there, and then it imports it. So, if somebody's got the ability to do that, there's, you've probably got bigger security problems, to be honest. But um, the other thing is speed. So, if you're aware of uh, the DBA tools module, they recently resorted to compiling all of their PS1 files into a single PSM1 file and seen crazy, crazy speed benefits over the, on the import of the module. So when you import it, it has to pass all the help for every function, and it's not something like it's 500 odd functions, maybe even more in DBA tools. So it needs to pass the help, it needs to pass the, the module manifest for all the functions, it needs to export them all. So obviously the bigger your module, the longer that takes. If it's all in one file, it just has to pass one file rather than 500 separate files. And the other one is uh, code signing. Um, it's it's not very popular in with public modules because it's expensive. But if you're signing your modules, you don't sign 500 files as part of your build process. If it's all compiled into one file, you just literally have to you're distributing your PSP one and a PSM one. You just sign the two files and what anything else that you may be distributing as part of that. So all this build script does is um, get the module manifest import it, it's basically a hash table, it works out some files, uh, some, some folders, and then it gets all of the public functions from the public folder. It creates a destination path called output, which is what I put in the git ignore file. Um, and then it creates the, the output folder up there, then it creates it again, and then it gets the module manifest information and it, I've got a really horrible regex, which puts all of the names of my public functions into that manifest. Um, there's various reasons I had to do it this way, and mainly because my colleagues decided to uh, write their manifests in about six or seven different ways. But uh, I think the uh, next configuration module does this. PSAG and Invoke Build all have their own way of doing this as well. This is just my happy way of dealing with some of the internal modules that, that I have to work with. Um, and my uh, some of the developers who who decide to do crazy things, um, and then it's just going to go through and add all of the content of the PS1 files to the PSM1 file. So should be able to run this. So do toolbox. Build. Why does that going to happen? There you go. Because it didn't give it a path. So I've now got an output folder, which you can see, I don't know if you can see on the screen or not, it's slightly darker than the rest. And that's because this is a Git repository and I've got in my Git ignored. So that it's slightly different color and it's telling Git to ignore that. And I've got two files here, I've got a PSM1 file and I've got a PSD1 file. The PSM1 file is all of my functions that I didn't bother updating, as well as the ones that I did. Get things status is there. And the new PowerShell module and everything else. And then in the PSD1, it's added all the functions to export in there for you. So if you're writing a module um, which you're sharing with colleagues and you have this shared 
if you have a build script which does all of, the, all of this content for you, you go and add a new function, you run the build script, you don't have to remember to update the manifest. And this is becoming the, the accepted way to now build modules. I mean, you see my build script, and it does the basics. It doesn't run a script analyzer, and it doesn't do all of these, these nice things, bells and whistles that the likes of PSAT, it does and things like that. <coughs> Will be. <coughs> but it works. And if you if you're just doing simple modules which are all public functions, it works a treat. And the benefit of this is you can also run the build script as part of the build pipeline as and locally. So if you want to test this locally, you can run the build script that compiles it. And then you should be able to do I'm just gonna slow down. I haven't drunk too much here. Two looks. I'll put toolbox.psv1, get command, module toolbox. And that's all of the. That's all of the functions. Um, and then you'll get version, version numbers because you've got that in your module manifest at the top. So when you build a new version, you increment the number and then you can publish that in the partial gallery or similar. Now in order to um to share with colleagues, there's various ways. Kevin Marquette has uh, quite a good post on sharing content with, with colleagues. Um in, in all thanks there's not much he hasn't covered in in those posts. So I definitely check his blog post out on that input. You can set up you can set up a file share to share to publish modules too. It's obviously not, uh, not not the best in terms of usability and functionality, but it's a way of doing it if that's all you've got available to you. Um, you've got GitLab Community Edition, which is free if you don't mind standing up your own server. You've got GitHub, which is free for uh, public repositories. You now have private repositories on there uh, as standard. You've got Azure DevOps repos. So there's lots of, there's lots of things there. And um, what I've got here is a ProGet instance, which I'm currently running as a VM in Azure. <coughs> and I've got um, an internal PS gallery proxy, an internal chocolatey proxy. Um, if you haven't used chocolatey, you should. Um, you can pay me after Stevie. Um, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> um, and then you know, I've got a test. The test feed in here, which has stuff in. So that toolbox, uh, the toolbox function, uh, the toolbox module that I've got, we should be able to publish that. If I go and add, there's other metadata, other metadata in here that, that you need to add when you publish modules to the PowerShell gallery or to uh, other new get feeds. And um, so tags, I'm going to change that within the other keyboard. This one's a little I um, don't think I need anything else. Do you need a license in there? Let's add it just in case. So, chain self promotion. I'll type that quickly. Um, save that. You see, if I've added the PS. The one which is in the module folder which doesn't have the functions in it. So then I would just do build again and then you'll see that it's rebuilt and got the content in. So that's the quick iteration of how you get module. So all you, you all of your stuff in GitHub and wherever you still have all of these separate files, so it's easy to work on. You still have your PSD1 file there, and then you run your build script. It compiles everything for you. It'll generally, as part of a concise build, it'll run tests against that, so you know that it's failed straight away. Um, and then you publish these two files, rather than having to publish all of these hundreds of files. And it's quicker. It's all the benefits of uh, having less load. Any module. So, with any luck, publish module 
I'm in the wrong folder. Uh, I don't have anything set up for that. Bit of this now. CD presentation is You need to give it the name of the path so you can do publish. Specialized description and author. See? Uh, that's, I knew I missed something. 
Oh, there's that. Description. Description. Uh, oh. I knew I missed something. Please, sir. Uh, Yay. Thank you. <laughs> this is why you do it as part of a pipeline, because you set it and then you don't have to do it again. Save that. Oh, man. Nice. Oh, nice. I will finish this one. It has an error. That's Yay! Invalid API key. Yeah, well. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Let's go over here. I don't know what to say. That even gives an API. It did give an API. It could just be wrong one. Uh, I'm going to go and get the right one. You should talk amongst yourself as well, that's all the program. Uh, if you like, please. Yeah. Uh, aha. Yeah, I did give it the wrong API key. Is this the error message? Don't be fooled by how long it takes to error. Oh, oh, it didn't error. It didn't error. Please. Please. Oh, two packages in there now. Oh. Two box. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got uh, all of your information in here, metadata, and then you've got your PSM1 file and your PSD1 file, and then the general new get stuff. Uh, so you, so yeah, that's basically my transition from um, being a, an, an admin script order to, I'm not, I'm not going to use the terminology PowerShell developer, all the self arguments as well. But what I did is now, which I attribute to learning PowerShell, is spent sitting writing PowerShell, or more more recently, Terraform and avoiding on templates. Um, so yeah, most of my day now is spent in VS Code, um, coding, which is that what a developer does, probably. Um, and I and I live in Azure DevOps in Azure in VS Code, in PowerShell seven because Windows PowerShell is a devil. Um, <laughs> and trying to make everything cross cross platform because half of my colleagues are on Mac, so um, it's 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 up my journey and. One thing and I would attribute to being where I am today is learning PowerShell and the community. It's just a brilliant community. I can attest for that. And obviously, I haven't made it out to uh, to summit or anywhere really because you don't let me out much. But <laughs> it's, it's an awesome community, and, and that journey from going from having just all the scripts to to now having everything in a pipeline is really rewarding and it, it frees up so much of your time. So I, I, I would definitely recommend it. Is there any questions around the entire process? I know I kind of flew through that. I tried to explain obviously the having the param block changed it to a function. But so Brett's helped me out in the past a lot on uh, the Slack and the Discord. So you guys need to join it for sure. He's very helpful and very knowledgeable. So cheers. So, so, I mean, so Brett, th thanks for sharing with us. Super appreciate that. Uh, I have questions. If we go all the way back to the beginning of the presentation, you know, you were sort of making light of writing a bunch of scripts locally, not yeah, writing them up, yeah. all that stuff. I think there's a lot of people who have made it to the, I have a GitHub repo, yeah. my own personal repo, and if I want to set up, uh, I, I'm just curious what your experience is like when you started to get people on board to share code and to put it in the repository, what's it, what's it like trying to 
have a repository that's central that everybody uses, someone sort of has to be the decider of what goes into that repository and what gets approved. How did that work yeah. out? So, so in my experience, what you'll generally find within a team is you'll have kind of one pioneer of somebody who's always pushing that, well, we need to be doing this, we should be doing this. And in the past few places I've worked, that has been me. Um, I, when I, I, where a lot of these scripts came from, I was I was third line administrator, primarily working with Active Directory, and everything was versioned in folders, and all of my colleagues were like, oh, what, what do you want to do that for? What, GitHub, what? Like, there was a lot of, there was a lot of, I think, misconceptions around why you would need it and the benefits of it, and they were quite happy just using scheduled tasks on an admin server and incrementing a version number at the end of the file every, every time. They, they've seen it as a big learning curve. So going from, because it's not just a case of, oh, well, I'm not going to put these scripts in GitHub. You have to learn parts of Git. And whilst the, your, initially your workflow might just be Git branch, Git commit, Git push, it's still a lot, it's still a lot to learn for, for people who don't use Git every day. And, for me, that was a massive hurdle that I had to overcome. But once I learned the fundamentals and seen the benefits, and you, I think with Git, you don't see the benefits until it bails you out of the crap. <laughs> when, when, it, when it saves your bacon because you've done something silly, which if you've done that in a file share, you would have no way of recovering from, that's when Git clicks with people and goes, Hold on a minute, it's doing all of this for me. It's keeping everything, it keeps a log of what's changed, and I can go back to any point in that, in, in that timeline. So if somebody used to change six months ago, I can go back. You don't have to revert everything, you can go back and make a copy of what it was and see what the difference is. Once you, once you get into that, it's, it's, it's huge. Uh, it's actually, I've got a presentation, um, it's uh, partial day in the UK, which is uh, called GitOps. Uh, which has just been accepted, and that's uh, Git for for ops people, right? Because for me, it was a case of once you got the grips with the the fundamentals locally, how to do things locally, how to set up a Git repository, how to create branches, it it, it clicked, and it, I think there's a massive shift from ops to sort of de development with it with Git, and it's it's a hard hurdle to overcome initially. So, um, I mean, I'd be more than willing to come back and do that presentation as well if, if you would have me doing that. If it's something you, you think would, would benefit the group. Um, but yeah, um, but in, in within a team, I, fortunately, I work in a team now where um, it is the first thing that we, we do. Everything we do is in a repo. We, we, have, we, do, we still have a folder full of scripts which we resort to, but they're not running in production. It's scripts that we found useful at one point and we've stashed them away in a folder. But everything that runs in production is in a, in a Azure DevOps pipeline and it's, in, um, and it's in source control and version control. And generally, the developers, us and our team within the DevOps team, whatever you want to call us, have access to it. And our managers have access to it. So you can see who committed what, you can see what changes were made. And it, it adds that visibility, which I think helps in terms of everyone can see what's going on and you, you get more valuable input from people outside the team because they can see what's going on. Um, so you, you tend to find there's a pioneer of somebody who's pushing the boundaries, but once you get onto a team where everybody is at least at that basic level, the, the, the stuff you can achieve above, above that is, is, is mind blowing. So, it's uh, it's definitely something that, and I think it's always going to be going to become more prominent. And um, learning Git as an admin now is pretty much a fundal, fundamental part of a job description because everything Office three six five you can't do certain things without having PowerShell knowledge because Microsoft literally don't give you the option. And if I was a recruiter looking at two admins who had both done Office 365 and Active Directory, and one of them said, oh, I've been working with Git, and I've got GitHub, and I've got a blog, and I've been doing all this open source stuff, just that knowledge around the software development lifecycle would be enough for me to say this person is probably more suited to the direction we're going in terms of automation and scripting. 
Uh, the question for the group where somebody asked me something. Uh, what does the presenter think about Pesha? So, so Mark, just speak up. Just yeah, uh, Brett, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, have you uh, have you considered or looked at uh, something like a, a linter that would enforce coding standards for the your group, your team? Um, we have script analyzer rules set on our internal repository. Um, and we're quite fortunate in that most of us do generally have the same style anyway. We do have a couple of solutions architects and people outside the team who come in and put braces and parentheses in crazy locations. But we do we do have script analyzer rules uh, and pester tests on most of the stuff that we put into production. Um, and if somebody puts a pull request in which doesn't meet the basic guidelines that we require, it'll just fail the build and they'll have to fix that. So it, um, Linton as such, aside from script analyzer, you can define quite a lot of your custom rules within script analyzer settings. Which you can have as part of either a pre-commit pre hook, pre pre hook in GitHub or one of your uh, Git repositories, or you can have it run as part of your build. So when your build build fails, it'll notify them as part of the pull request to say, "No, you're going to have to go fix this. It's not going in." Because because some linters actually will will change will change programs just to enfor to enforce not to not to reject the code. Uh, because it doesn't it doesn't meet a standard, but will actually um, have some capabilities of changing code so that what gets ch what ultimately gets checked in does meet coding standards. Yeah. So uh, Script Analyzer has that. It uses uh, something called Invoke Formatter, and it is a, yeah. a fix off that. So you can. <laughs> yeah. It, right. I think it's what, I think it's what VS Code uses when when you see when I formatted the scripts when I started. It just invoke formatter and it uses the styles you've got defined and automatically formats your script that way. So you, you, you could possibly do that, but um, personally, from an education point for people who are putting pull requests in, I think rather than letting them write anything and you fixing it on your build, it's more educational for them to see where it doesn't fit the required guidelines on your repository. But it's obviously different skills for different folks if it, if it works for you and it's just a case of race position and then um, that, that might work for you. Um, but yeah, I, I quite like the education point and uh, trying to beat it out of colleagues. Because <laughs> 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 they'll just do it next, they'll just do it next time and then somebody will ask how many builds have failed and it'll look bad on us. <laughs> so, so just a reminder to anybody online, Feel free to ask questions. Just remember, you have to unmute yourself. Um, but at this point, oh, uh, Brett, will you uh, be posting this code online or allow us to post it to our repository? Um, yeah, I'll have to dig the old scripts back out again because obviously I've butchered them. But I'll, uh, I'll put the old script sure. in, 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 into a folder and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stick them up on GitHub or uh, wherever you want them. And the post will be on there as well. Yeah, I think the Danish asked, what do I think of Pesta? Um, 